yeah, Shanghai locked down. Two months after the CCP said they would not lock down Shanghai. Well, initially they were like, oh, we'll just like, we'll like temporarily lock down half of the city then the other half. For five days. For five days. Each. Total city lockdown, two months. Yeah. I mean, I think this was the case in which the local party officials effed up a little bit. And, and then, what happened to the local party officials? He got promoted in the National People's Congress. Yeah, because he was like a Xi Jinping guy. Yeah. Yeah. Usually this would mean he gets purged, but, you know, his loyalty to Xi Jinping actually got him a higher promotion. Yeah. Let that be a lesson. Don't don't worry about competence. Does Just worry about loyalty. A suck up? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Not so wise, Shelley. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've I worked in corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, like really the Shanghai lockdown was sort of like the perfect microcosm of the the entire zero COVID lockdown. Yeah, like remember there was that guy who was like dead and being carried away and he was in a body bag and then it turned out he was still alive. I oh, yeah. yeah. I forgot about that, actually. That was nightmare. He was, Yeah, he was in a gurney and they were wheeling him out and then the body bag started moving and people freaked out and this was all on camera. Yeah, yeah. which also considering how many body bags we're seeing in China now. That's a little worrying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they don't really check if you're dead. I mean, it doesn't you, matter how, because how, they'll how, make sure in the end you're dead. Yeah. Oh, it's it's kind of like uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail during the plague. And he like guy goes around and he's like, you know, bring out your dead. And people pile on the bodies and the guy's like, oh, I'm not dead yet. And uh, this, yeah. This, and then they, what do they, don't they like bean him or something? Oh, he's, yeah. yeah. He's like, oh, you will be soon. <laughs> it's like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you saw, you know, there was food shortages, people dying in lockdown, not being able to get medical treatment. Um, and these were things we'd seen in a lot of other Chinese cities as well. But also the fact that it happened in Shanghai was a shock to people. Because, I mean, that's like one of the richest, most prosperous cities in China. It's got a lot of the middle and upper class of Chinese society. It's, it's a shining beacon of how great China is. Yeah, really. It was. That's supposed to be like, hey, look how great we, China is. Come invest. Come invest. International city, you know, yeah. lots of expats. Like, and I you think know. it was so intense because people in Shanghai had seen very publicly like what was going on in the other places. I think Xi'an was another, like a very high profile one where a lot yeah. of stuff was captured on camera. That was last December yeah. when they had like a three week lockdown or something like that. Yeah. But Shanghai had it worse, I think. Well, for one, because mm -hmm. it was two months, but also because... I think there was uh, a lot of political pressure mm -hmm. on Shanghai. So like it became such like a focus of censorship and uh, repression in terms of like trying to censor all the stories that were coming out of Shanghai. It was just like, and then people getting very mad about that and like mm -hmm. really fighting back against that censorship. Yeah, and, and the party really just doubling down on zero COVID is Xi Jinping's thing. We're not... Changing this full steam ahead. We're never going to change zero COVID. It totally works. Look at how great China is. And well, well, you know, the party knew zero COVID had to end, I think at some point. I mean, if they started by changing the definition of zero COVID to meaning zero community spread. Oh, they did that in Xi'an. They, right. Yeah. So like they had already started doing some of the shenanigans like a year ago when they were like, oh, uh, yeah, it doesn't count if there are people who still have COVID, but they're already in quarantine. Yeah. Or like, what was it, zero COVID on a local level? Yeah. It's all the different words were the same thing, which is like, essentially like once you get hauled away to a quarantine camp, it doesn't matter if you get COVID or not because you're not going to count. Uh, and so the focus was on just hauling as many people away to quarantine as possible. So Chinese people started getting more afraid of quarantine than COVID. Especially as video came out of like those being horrible places or people dying there. I mean, a lot of people go to quarantine camps and they did not have COVID. Mm -hmm. So it would have been much worse if like they were really, really high infection zones. But like it was... It was like a lot of it was just like terrible sanitation. Like mm -hmm. if you were sick, it's not somewhere you want to be. There's no doctors and nurses. There was the, the case the like a few months ago. The sheets were not even necessarily washed. Yeah. Like you might be reusing old old like um, blankets from another person who just left and you don't know whether they were sick or not. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the case of like 
a young girl who died in a quarantine camp because she started having like seizures or something. There was no medical staff at this quarantine camp and her relatives weren't able to get her help in time, essentially. But like for the most part, it wasn't that these places were hot beds of COVID. It was just like the whole thing was so terrible that nobody wanted to have to go there. I mean, the worst part was probably that uh, that bus carrying people who did or even didn't have COVID carrying them off to a quarantine center. And then that bus crashed and killed dozens of people. Yeah, that was definitely a major escalation in like sort of the pressure cooker of zero COVID. It, it had been building a lot over the years. And then the bus crash, that was that was a big one. Yes. That was a big one. Because what's one of those things where like, that could be me. Yeah. Because it's not any of those people's fault that they got on the bus because they were essentially forced to. Yes. Under the zero COVID policy. And as, like we said, we we're talking about that, like they would just quarantine. And like if there are cases where if there was one person in your apartment complex, not even in your apartment building that got COVID, sometimes entire complexes were hauled off to quarantine. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't matter because you, if you could be considered a, a close contact of someone, like all those crazy videos of people like fleeing Ikea and Costco and things like oh, that. yeah, yeah. When like somebody had tested, like somebody had gotten like a red flag on their COVID app like earlier that day at some point in the store. So now they're going to lock down the store and everybody's running for the exits. Like that is kind of the... the that was the environment that everybody was operating in. And then that kind of led to the Bridgeman protest right before the National People's Congress. Yeah. I would say that you're right in that Shanghai was like the first big domino to fall in this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like things like the bus crash were big, like all of these things that the CCP was trying to keep people from finding out about. Right. And then there's the that apartment fire in well, Xinjiang. But before that, I think the bridge man was a significant uh, turn in the whole zero COVID thing, uh, where, where that guy who was quickly arrested, you know, put up those banners, um, you know, complaining about things, complaining specifically about the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping. Well, like one of his set of banners were specifically about like, we don't want COVID tests, we want freedom. Like mm -hmm. a lot of things like complaining about like the zero COVID stuff. And then another banner was basically like, you know, Xi Jinping like step down. <laughs> yeah. Essentially. And then that message was, uh, you know, repeated throughout China. People were scrawling it in bathrooms and it became known as like the toilet revolution since bathrooms are the only place in China where there are no surveillance cameras yet. Yet. And also Chinese uh, people abroad uh, yes. also began doing the same thing. And this was really like, I think that was like a big turning point where people started to get the idea, oh, we're all upset. Because the Chinese Communist Party and communism in general likes to divide people, make them afraid of each other. And this was a moment where people realized like, oh, no, I'm not alone. We're, we're all kind of on the same page. Yeah. Right even now. for overseas Chinese students, say, at a university in the U.S. or the U.K., somewhere to post some of that, like, that same language on uh, posters around the campus or to attend a demonstration, like, that is ballsy for them. Because, yeah. like, they will, like we mentioned earlier... Uh, in the episode, like they could get, you know, reported the, to authorities in China. Mm -hmm. That was what that guy who got arrested by the FBI was trying to do. He was trying to get the other Chinese um, pro-democracy person like in trouble, like get their family in trouble with Chinese police in China. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, what a snitch. But so there was a fire in the Xinjiang apartment building and the official death toll is 10, but probably... At least 40 some people died. Mm -hmm. um, this is reporting from like weaker dissidents and things like that who had had like people who had had multiple family members die in the same fire. Even though it was supposed to be mainly Han Chinese people in the apartment building. Am I, I correct in that? I don't know if that's true. Okay. Um, I mean, the apartment building was in Urumqi. Mm -hmm. uh, but like there was, I think, like credible reports of at least like one weaker family, including kids that were like six of them died or something. So that alone uh, mm -hmm. is counting for six people. Right. And then, yeah. So I think the the death toll was definitely larger than 10, but we don't have an exact number. Yeah. And this was a situation where like the, the COVID workers were kind of blocking the fire trucks from getting in. I don't think it's that clear exactly what happened mm -hmm. in terms of whether it was the COVID workers blocking it or if the fire trucks got delayed in general because of like the COVID policy. I don't know if it was like the COVID workers at that building stopping the fire hmm. fighters because like that building was visibly on fire. Like yeah. 
um, there were video taken from other apartment buildings of that building, and you can hear people screaming. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if it was like that clear cut as to exactly why they got delayed, but uh, you know, people across China saw this, and it led to this like like this huge moment of rage because it's just like the bus crash where people were like, "Oh, that could be me." Yeah, and like it was people were comparing it like it started online actually and people were comparing it to like when Dr. Li Wenlong died mm-hmm. the covid whistleblower guy who got in trouble for texting a group of other doctors about covid uh he wasn't even trying to like publicly warn people about anything and then he got taken in by the police department mm-hmm. and warned and then he eventually ended up dying of covid and after that happened there was this like huge amount of rage uh, from the Chinese people online and the CCP kind of had to just let it happen mm-hmm. because they couldn't keep a lid on it. And that's kind of what was happening after the fire in the apartment building. Yeah, that the mass like, protests there all was, over China. Yeah, before even people went on the street, mm-hmm. there was like a huge buildup of anger on line that almost couldn't be censored. Mm-hmm. Like they were trying to censor it as much as they could, but people were fighting the censorship. So there was like more and more outrage building online. And then that kind of spilled over into in-person protests yeah. all around the country, uh, often from young Chinese people in places like Shanghai and Beijing. Yeah, which uh, a lot of people kind of just wrote them off as being, you know, little pinks or nationalistic, you know, brainwashed because of you know, a couple decades of patriotic education by the Communist Party after the Tiananmen protests largely led by students. I mean, these are people that were not alive yeah. during the Tiananmen protests, so. And probably never heard of it. No, very likely. Yeah, now, if if only the Communist Party hadn't, you know, covered up all mentions of the Tiananmen Square massacre, then maybe those young people this year would have been afraid to come out and protest, but they weren't, they were too bold. Uh, what was called the blank paper revolution, the white paper revolution, the A4 revolution. Oh, yeah. Like different words. But like because people were holding up blank pieces of paper, uh, you know, as a protest against the censorship. Mm-hmm. And in Shanghai, literally people were calling for the CCP to step down and Xi Jinping to step down. Yeah. And I think what was interesting about this is, you know, anytime there's like like when we were in Hong Kong or when you see protests like this, there's always people like, okay, when are they going to send in the tanks? And the CCP has evolved past that in a lot of ways. Like, they're smarter about how they repress. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were no... I don't think they had riot police in 1989. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, that just wasn't a thing in China. Yeah. And, like, the system of surveillance, they're just able to arrest people after the fact. So you don't see... You don't have, like, a visible martyr. Right. And, and I think the lesson... the One of the lessons the Communist Party took from Tiananmen is that the the problem with what happened in Tiananmen Square is that Western media were able to film it. And they filmed some of the violence and they f- that are happening in Beijing near the square. And they also filmed Tank Man and it became iconic. And now everyone's got their, you know, mobile phones shooting video. And so, so like, it's so easy for one, uh, you know, too violent move by the CCP or by the police to become this video of a martyr or to have this big international impact. So the trick is to not let things escalate to the point where people are able to to get video of it and post it online. I mean, I think Chinese people also understand the power of a video, right? Which is why so many people, like they're always filming, like you always see whenever there's a protest, you see everybody with their phones up Mm -hmm. because everybody knows that like, okay, this is, you have to record it uh, so that people know this happened. And this was happening also when people were getting hauled away to quarantine and stuff like that. They would be posting videos of like the terrible quarantine conditions and being like, please let other people know about this. Like, yeah, yeah, like they understand that video is incredibly powerful for, you know, showing people what's actually happening. Right. And this is why, you know, we're not seeing riot police in China just opening fire on protesters because that would be captured on video. And the CCP understands the danger of that and that that will become a political uh, problem that they would have to deal with Then other countries are like, oh, well, they're actually shooting people. Yeah, I mean, like that might make people hesitate like two whole weeks to pump money into China. 
I know. And they can't afford those two weeks, Chris. <laughs> That's possible. Which, very possible. Which, which is again, why? So like, what, what are they doing? They're, they had sort of let some of the, they censored a lot of it, but they couldn't censor everything. And they let some of it kind of happen. But then afterwards they were doing things like, you know, tracking down using, you know, people's cell phone GPS or surveillance fa with face recognition. They were tracking down people who were at the protest and they would do things like threaten them or invite them to the police station to discuss things or even arresting them. But they don't even have to necessarily do that because people get the idea that like they'd been to one protest. Uh, they thought that they were anonymous because they were wearing a mask and maybe even a hat. But the fact is the CCP knew they were there and they and basically was like, yeah, if you do this again, it's going to be big trouble. So that's terrifying. And in many ways, it's more terrifying than going to a protest where, you know, your chances of being shot are one in a thousand. Uh, and if you're not one of those people, you can get away. Right. But in this case, no matter what, like you're never going to get away because they, they know you were there. And also, like, instead of being tied to a group of people, it also, once again, isolates people. 